Grumpy Old Geeks, a weekly talk show hosted by Brian Schulmeister and Jason DeFilippo, discussing the finer points of what went wrong on the internet and who's to blame. Welcome to Grumpy Old Geeks. I'm Jason DeFilippo. And I'm Brian Schulmeister. Happy 10 year anniversary, Brian. Oh boy, 10 years of doing this. 10 years. All right. Well, let's wrap it up. Show's over. Okay. See you, everybody. I'm done. <laughs> Stick a fucking fork in it. <laughs> yep. That's a, that's a good run. Better than most. Uh, did not get the uh, Joe Rogan money. So uh, we're out. Yeah. Seriously. Seriously. <laughs> where's, uh, yeah, where's the damn paycheck? <laughs> uh, the problem is we're not racist enough, Jason. I know. Or misogynistic. <laughs> or. Yeah. Actually, I saw a really funny cartoon the other day. Um, I, I'll have to dig it back up again for the show notes. But the whole thing was like uh, some guy, some kid was out there selling lemonade for 50 cents. Nobody was buying. And he, he, he then writes, unwoke lemonade, 50 cents. I would like some of that unwoke lemonade. And he sells out and he's like, <laughs> I feel really bad about this, but the money seems to be making up for it. There you go. <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah. yeah Good times. Welcome to. Unwokey old Greeks, yeah. old geeks. <laughs> Unwokey old Greeks. We're gonna have to do accents now. Oh God! No, uh, opa. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I uh, got a little bit of follow up. Although technically, it's not a follow up. We barely touched about Sil- talked about Silicon Valley Bank because of the timing. Because it happened so fast. It started basically when we turned off our microphones last week, and it was done well before we started to record again the following week. So we never really talked about it. Yeah, I also didn't give that much of a Yeah, me either. I did like this article, though, that kind of gives a little bit of a wrap-up on it. Uh, It's called Why No One Cried for Silicon Valley Bank's Customers. And the reason I like this article is it does talk a little bit about what we've talked about for quite some time, you know, the good old days of the internet versus what it's now become. Um, Yeah, so the article just kind of gets into tech used to be a lot of fun, and it was – you know, driven by innovation and it was driven by by experimentation and new technologies coming out. And But like as all businesses do, they start to solidify and then the CFOs start to become in charge of everything. Yep. And it's all driven by money. So some of the quotes in here, the tech sector, at least parts of it, then trended into over-financialization. Instead of thinking about what problems they could solve for people, companies started to look only at growth and margins. They became extractive. DoorDash, for instance, counted tips toward its minimum delivery worker payments, changing the policy only after uproars. And this happened. VCs, not builders, became the tech industry's most recognizable names. All became about squeezing a bit more money out of the balance sheet. And it had a cost, although it wasn't an apparent one. So when it came time to save tech companies over that weekend, some, including maybe perhaps us a little bit, preferred to burn down the system instead of keep it going. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, okay. Just to quick clarify, I'm not one of those people who wanted to see it burned down. (laughs) I don't want to see it burned down either. I'd like to see fundamental change. Well, I would like to see the regulation (laughs) that's in place actually used. (laughs) Yes, that would be nice. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then of course, obviously the move was common sense. They, they got their, their, their save, uh, because banking industry contagion was a real threat. So there you go. But, uh, I did like the article. It's really interesting about, uh, how tech has changed and how they've squandered any goodwill. So yeah. Over financialization is something we've never had to worry about with this podcast. Nope, under financialization. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Every week we deal with under financialization. Yes. But, uh, a decade of under financialization. Um, yeah. And, uh, I put this one in here because I thought it was kind of interesting how Elon Musk knocked Tesla's full driving, full self-driving off course. Since this is the 10th anniversary and self-driving cars are still 20 years away, yep. from, which is exactly what You'd we said. I think when we we'd only be 10 thing. years away now, but nope. <laughs> this is not how it works. Yeah. This is not how it works. It's, uh. There's very there's some Einsteinian physics going on here with as as you approach full self driving cars they just uh, still twenty years away no matter yep. what you do uh, and I guess a lot of the blame for Teslas is uh, just because Elon didn't like sensors so okay well. <laughs> which is what we've known all along that's why I don't know why they're saying that it, it, I mean like why the hell is the Washington Post covering this that is half of my half of my problem with this is like okay we're really bored now and we're just rehashing all the old shit that we've already known well i I mean it's it's interesting in lieu of what's happening over at twitter where we're seeing a raging egomaniac with absolutely no guardrails in charge and they're pointing out that the same thing has happened to tesla 
that's always been my issue with Tesla. I think it's a great company. I wish he wasn't running it. Or even if he were running it, I wish he had a board that wasn't just full of yes men. Nobody challenges him on anything. He just does what he wants. Nope. I, I almost got hit by another Tesla when I was at Whole Foods the other day. Yes, I know. First world problems. Um, <laughs> but I, I I came up with a new a new saying for the, the Tesla owners that drive through the Whole Foods parking lot. Um, now, when you say D-bag, you, you immediately comes to mind an over-muscled, tribal tattoo, be-soaked, you know, muscle head dimwit. That's what, when I think of a D-bag, basically a date rapist. I take issue with the tribal tattoos, unfortunately, because I, I just happen to be in that sweet spot when they were cool and I'm covered in them. But Oh, yeah. see, I okay. got I got mine before they were cool. So I kind of I kind of go with that. It's like I like Nirvana before they were cool, too. <laughs> that that one's on you, Brian. Sorry, that one's on you. Yeah. Uh, and then I'm just thinking, you know what? We, we don't have D bags anymore. Now we have T bags. So those are our Tesla drivers. And I just I don't know why it made me chuckle as I was trying as I was dodging them for my it's life. A solid like, goddamn Whole Foods, tea bag. It's a solid Whole Foods joke is you're going to pick up your matcha chi. Yep. That's yep. about it. Yep. I go there for my every morning I go and I have my four dollar vanilla uh, espresso and uh, my eight dollar pork carnitas uh, burrito. <laughs> that's my daily routine. <laughs> and uh, and yes, I have to dodge them still to this day. So. Uh, anyway, yeah, so yeah, still 20 years out on full self-driving cars. Not surprising. And uh, hey, whatever happened to the flying uh, flying Ubers? Wasn't that a big thing that we uh, kind of lost along the way? That's 40 years off. Oh, shit. Always okay. 40. So, you know. I don't. I don't think we're going to be around for that <laughs> uh, one. I, if, we're, if we have a 40th anniversary from Grumpy Old Geeks, I will be shocked. No, it's funny that uh, just a, a little walk down memory lane. When we started this show, everybody's like, you're not old. Stop saying you're old. But to us, we were because I had I was 41 when we started the show. I'm 51 now. Jesus Christ. Um, and that was and we were both right at the age where we were aging out of tech because this was right at the height yeah. of uh, basically ageism in Silicon Valley. Like if you wanted to get a job at Facebook, there was no way you're getting a job. Not at a Facebook. chance. Yep. Any of those any of those little shit shops. Yeah, we were both dealing with uh, basically needing to pivot because we had aged out. So, of course, we felt like grumpy old geeks. Yeah. yeah. And that's, you and know, now we literally are. Yeah. yeah, that's the thing. It's like you have a kid who mm -hmm. is how old? And we'll be turning seven. <laughs> that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Uh, so far, you've what had cancer twice. I've had a stroke. Um, an alcohol recovery. I've got, you know, titanium in my legs. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, it, eventually in a long enough timeline, the survivability rate does fall to zero. Yes, it does. Hopefully we'll be here for at least the 20 year anniversary. I'm hoping so. I'm hoping so. I'm still having fun, even though we are under undercapitalized or whatever the hell that no, we're under financialized. <laughs> yeah, it. I would say it pays the booze bills, but you're off them and I am temporarily too. So there we go. There we go. Pays for the burritos. Yes, it does. Sort of. Almost. <laughs> Almost. Yeah, I am if they, the, they weren't Whole Foods burritos. <laughs> I know. I, I have to I have, I would say I have to go to Trader Joe's, but I don't know if you've seen in, inflation in Southern California. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to go to Vallarta. That's it. I'm just going to have to start <laughs> going to Vallarta. In the news. Well, the law runs slowly, but eventually we do get around, and it's nice to finally see some repercussions for cryptocurrency endorsements. The SEC has filed charges against the celebrities, uh, a bunch of celebrities as part of its broader charges filed against crypto entrepreneur Justin Sun and three of his companies, Tron Foundation Limited, BitTorrent Foundation Limited, and Rainberry Incorporated, formerly BitTorrent, for the unregistered offer and sale of crypto asset securities Tronix and BitTorrent. Now, I personally would like to see most of the coverage focused on Justin Sun because he's the real problem here. Mm -hmm. But, you know, celebrity culture. So eight celebrities, which included rapper Soldier Boy and Little Yachty. That is a celebrity, mm. apparently. Yep. Really? <laughs> Singers Yachty. Austin Mahone and Akon, <laughs> Lindsay Lohan, Jake Paul, Neo, and adult film superstar Kendra Lust for illegally touting these cryptocurrencies and not disclosing that they were compensated for doing so and the amount of their compensation. So uh, all the mentioned celebrities except for Soldier Boy and Austin Mahone agreed to pay a total of over $400,000 in disgorgement, interest, and penalties to settle the charges without admitting or denying the SEC's findings. Okay, whatever. Yeah, well, you know, they, the wheels ground slow, but they get there. 
Yeah, and you know, yeah, somebody needs to find this guy and uh, kind of take him out back. Little, little Justin. Well, he's the problem. Like, I, yeah. I want, I want to see, I want to learn more about his punishments. I could care less. I feel bad for the celebrities, but you know, also knowing how all this stuff works. What about their managers? Their managers, their, their agents, managers are the ones uh, that eventually yeah. said, "Yeah, you should go ahead and do it." Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a lot of these. I mean, we've seen the fallout yep. after everything started to fall apart. I'm just still like, this goes back to being here for 10 years. You know, we started making fun of Bitcoin at the very beginning and called it a scam and it's mm -hmm. still a scam. And now finally, some people are starting to get, uh, get taken out back. And what's going on with, uh, uh, SBF, you know, we, we, we got kind of sidetracked by SFB or SVB <laughs> and we started about, we forgot about, uh, SBF. Yeah, you got to make sure home, you put that on or... every day. You don't want the skin cancer. Yeah, you don't. You don't. Yeah. Trust me. Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <That's> a... <laughs> I'm oh sure God. we'll hear about that soon. Like, again, wheels wheels rolling slowly. So Very slowly. At least he gets to stay at home and play his Xbox if he wants. Yeah, must be nice. Mm -hmm. uh, a TikTok ban is looking a lot more complicated than just shutting down the app. So we're in the midst. We just had the five-hour uh, testimony the other day. Uh, where a bunch of uh, puffed up senators tried to make themselves pretend that they understand tech and ask hard hitting questions from TikTok. Uh, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, that's not even worth reporting about. Uh, what I like about this article is saying, yeah, you know what? It's not just TikTok. Not even close. Not even close. Now, now let's just talk tracking pixels, uh, because if you're going to ban uh, use of, of use of TikTok on devices for government devices, as many states have done. Uh, they, they, you got to remove those TikTok tracking pixels. And what are they doing on government websites to begin with? That is the question. According to the report, Maryland was one of 27 states that had code for TikTok's tracking pixel embedded in official government websites. Uh, in Maryland's case, those were reportedly found on a state-run COVID website and related to an ad campaign from last year. Yeah, so it all... Get yeah, that it, data. This is all going to come back to ads. It's all yeah. going to come back to ads because it doesn't matter what you do with TikTok. All they got to do is run one ad somewhere and your data's out there. I mean, yeah. the this all comes down to privacy laws. It has nothing to do with yes, TikTok. Exactly. exactly. You know, we we have no privacy laws in this country. It's ridiculous. You know, we need our own GDPR. We've got we've got this hodgepodge of bullshit states, you know, putting things together. But we need a unified privacy framework for the country. Amen, Period. brother. And that's that's how you go after TikTok. You don't just go after TikTok in and of itself as the app. I know you you, you do it because it's the biggest app in the world right now, and it's gets it's going to get your constituents all interested. The way you do this is you make a federal, across the board. United States privacy law and TikTok has to abide by it. And if they do yeah. not abide by it, then you can ban them. Yeah, That's well, then how you, you do it. You don't ban them. You find them, you know, because they've got money. Preferably so more take than their coffee. Money. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure their coffee budget's pretty, pretty good, though. So I, I, we take a little bit of it. We'll take you know? a little bit of that. But um, yeah. in addition to that, the one thing that this article points out is, um, by the way, that's not TikTok is not the only app that this company has. And a lot of them are very popular. And they're also funneling all the data. So yeah. why are we picking on just one thing? And again, to your point, Jason, privacy laws. Yeah. It's, yep. it, this whole thing is just it's, – it's ridiculous. It, the, the whole thing is ridiculous. It's, it makes no sense to go, just go after this one company when we know that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of these out there. Yep. And it's just going to keep coming and keep happening. So until we you know, fix that one main problem – we're kind of it, this is all just this is all theater it's all yep. fucking theater yes this is more and, about the senators than anything else yeah well at least tiktok was smart they did pay for a bunch of their influencers to go to dc and meet with their actual representatives which was smart because mm -hmm. what they're what they're doing is they're taking people who actually make a living off of tiktok and who you know basically are part of the economy here in the United States and are actually contributors to the economy, go meet with their representatives and say, hey, you guys are being idiots. Stop it. You know, this is we're making money here. Figure out your other problems, but don't take away our breadwinner just because you can't figure out how to do your job. Right. Yeah. So <laughs> I don't know. It's But at least they were upfront about it. They're like, you know, we paid for these people to come. We paid for their plane tickets. We paid for their hotel. So, yeah, we did that. They weren't hiding anything. It's not like they're Republicans or something. Jesus. Uh, so that's 
Well, I, I give them kudos for that. I do. I agree. I think it's 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 fine for them to do that. I totally agree. So, and I don't really, I I don't think this is TikTok. TikTok is really the problem here. I think it's it's the fact that we just cannot. We we give zero shits about privacy, and TikTok knows it, and they're exploiting it. End of story. Right, and 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 you know, I still think this is this whole thing is just a proxy. It's a proxy war with China right now, and it's just taking up. It's sucking the air out of the room for other shit that we need to it's talk sucking about. Sucking the so, air out of the balloons we're not hearing about anymore. Yeah, what happened? To Where's all the follow up on the balloons? Jeez, come on. <laughs> Uh, wag the dog, wag the dog, I tell you. Mm-hmm. So we got a couple other links in here from the TikTok thing and all that. So if, go read at your leisure, but I'm sure everybody's sick of it right now. So let's let's talk about something everybody else is sick about. Brian, oh, you got some uh, chat. That's a nice, uh, <laughs> nice segue there. I was actually going to do about the exact same thing. <laughs> so, yeah, this is a great article over on Slate uh, about uh, chat GPT and the insane proliferation that we've seen where everybody's basically – bolting this onto their product uh, for no particular reason whatsoever. The title tells you everything you need to know about the entire article. Not everything needs a chat bot. Okay. Yeah. So countless developers, startups, companies, and software tools are rushing to incorporate cat GPT style bots into everything they possibly can, often in ways that are less scary than just plain weird, weird and pointless. Say it with me. Not everything needs a chat bot. A few examples. <laughs> you can chat with digital copies of your favorite books and essays and research papers now, even in PDF form. Google's version of the sorcery is named Talk to Books. Who knew the page master would turn out to be so prescient? You can chat can with I talk to Zephod, Wait, can I talk to Zephod Beeblebrox? <laughs> Apparently you can. All right, I'm in. <laughs> you can chat with Wikipedia articles or with YouTube uploads with a tool called Solid Point. You can even get summaries of all your favorite YouTube vids and see what other summaries are trending, whatever that means. Thanks to young companies like Interflection and Korea.ai, you can converse with fake business professionals and fake employees and even fake clients. While you're at it, go ahead and chat with this one app in order to generate prompts that you can, in turn, use to chat with a different app. <laughs> or talk to your favorite monkey face <laughs> NFT, courtesy of Althea.ai. Or you can talk with a made-up Gen Z kid to learn TikTok lingo thanks to Studio M64. You can even transform your own personal website into a chatbot through the services of the cleverly named startup Samur AI. Samurai. Well, why stop at your browser, Jason? <laughs> why not oh, get a mini chat GPT for every single Microsoft or Google product you use from PowerPoint to Messenger apps since both companies are rushing to put AI in every product? Or perhaps, you'd rather, o- <laughs> or perhaps you'd rather augment a chatbot on your favorite encrypted message app. I mean, haven't you always wanted to converse with your notes app or with your <laughs> dreams? Perhaps there's a chatbot that could talk me down here. <laughs> it's a great article. <laughs> pretty good pretty and at good. the end what he really points out is we've had these kind of bots for years they've been around there's they're, they're on facebook they'll chat with you they're you know they've been built into shopping carts online everywhere Phone everybody trees. hates them yeah. nobody likes them nobody wants any of this shit uh, too late too late yep. because <laughs> zapier's rolling out their plugin well chat gpt rolled out their plugin architecture and zapier is now integrating that to connect with 5000 plus apps so now you can <laughs> plug and play right into it and uh, they say why it's important you can automate tasks from within chat gpt's interface saving you time and the hassle of context switching instead of jumping between a bunch of different tabs you can just ask chat gpt to perform a task in another app for you chat gpt please wipe my ass that's <laughs> what it's going to come down to unbelievable yet siri still sucks <laughs> yeah it does. GitHub is rolling out Copilot, like some updates to Copilot, so you can now integrate uh, all their shit into your your IDEs. And here's what I love: this is this is where I where the rubber meets the road. Mm-hmm. From their fact, does GitHub Copilot write perfect code? They reply: In a recent evaluation, we found that users accepted on average twenty six percent of all completions shown by GitHub Copilot. Hang on we a also second. found. <laughs> <laughs> actually a higher hit rate than outsourcing to india oh bring that one back <laughs> oh, all right oh, oh, oh we're gonna get emails <laughs> oh god we also found that on average more than 27 percent of developers code files were generated by github copilot and in certain languages like python that goes up to 40 percent however github copilot does not write perfect code Neither it is designed- john 
<laughs> Seriously. <laughs> it's designed to generate the best code possible given the context it has access to, but it doesn't test the code it suggests, so the code may not always work or even make sense. It sounds like half the programming divisions at half the companies worldwide. <laughs> They don't test their code and it is not perfect. <laughs> seriously. Can we get, you know, GitHub's co-unit test, please? <laughs> yeah, no, seriously. What was the uh, uh, Stack Overflow? Yes. I mean, I Stack, love Overflow Stack Overflow has a higher hit rate than this does. Yes. <laughs> and if you down. scroll down through the 7,000 responses and find the one that actually works. Yep. 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 Oh, man. Stack Overflow wow. made more careers than can even think about. I, I, I use Stack Overflow on almost every project I ever did. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was fantastic. And uh, I love this next one. Meta Slam's telco fee proposal says ISPs should pay their own network costs. Now, this comes out of Europe and uh company over there, Telefonica, mm -hmm. are trying to double dip. They're saying that uh, these big content companies should actually help pay for some of the infrastructure of the internet because right. they use the internet. Now, I, I want to know – what – like who fell into the vat of mushrooms over there and thought that this was a good idea? <laughs> because it's kind of like making farmers pay for the sewers because that's where their product ends up. It's like, no, websites should not have to pay for the infrastructure costs for the telcos because that's the telcos job. That's what they're there for. They they put in the infrastructure and then they charge people to use the infrastructure. That's how it works. Seriously. Uh, just – since we've already gone on woke, unwoke a few times on this episode and, and taken a few jabs at Republicans, I would like to point out that this is precisely what Barack Obama was saying when he said, you did not do this yourself, businesses. We built the roads. We built the infrastructure. You didn't do this all by yourself. Yeah. I think we're so, all agreed there. So you can't have it both ways. So this is one time that I actually agree with Meta. That's all I'm saying. I just, yeah, I agree was, too. It's, it, they, they shouldn't have to fund all that. They They could. I think it would be nice if these companies that have billions of dollars of market cap started a fund, just like the Wall Street fund that was started to basically bail out SVB. They should have funds like this. They should donate to. You want to build back that goodwill? Hey, CFOs at these companies, donate some coffee fund money into a into a group fund that helps out, particularly in low income areas or third world countries to get them internet. Brian, I would like to remind you that Facebook actually did that at one time, trying to offer free internet access to, you know, the poorer countries of Africa and India and parts of India. You, you that did didn't go with, over too well. Well, did it? they did. They did some other <laughs> bullshit there, didn't they? <laughs> just a little bit, but I'm just I, trying to say that my given point, the opportunity, they're going to do the wrong thing. No, no, no. My point is that they all donate to a fund. They don't personally implement because they will do skull fuckery. Yes. We, we have third party. <laughs> probably a government employee, which would be nice, that takes that money and then applies it. We don't let them do it themselves well, because the they, about, they will do bad things. Yeah, but then, you know, then, you know, they're, they, it comes back to the same problem that they're funding the telcos to build the infrastructure that the telcos use. So you need an entire infrastructure for the telcos. So they're not just getting free infrastructure. You know, that cost has to come back to the, the actual users. So we're not paying through the nose for the access that we're paying right now, especially here in the U.S. where it's just ridiculous compared to the rest of the world. You know, I don't, this is – things are fine the way they are. Stop. No, they are not. <laughs> <laughs> They're good enough. <laughs> says, the, says the old white guy who pays for uh, 14 bucks for a burrito every morning. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, got, I should start making those at home. <laughs> I really should. Especially since we're under financialized. Yes, yeah, seriously. <laughs> seriously. Uh, so here's in, in the final news of the day. Twitter now allows non-toxic slurs as long as the slurs are not hate speech. I would like this headline so much better <laughs> if it was Twitter now allows non-toxic slurs as long as the slurs are funny. Ah, good point. Good point. <laughs> Yes. Do we have a busting balls filter? Yeah, it's just busting balls. You know, there you go. But the, the best part about this is this week in Elon Musk's continuing mission to turn the entire world into an electrified dystopian hellscape. <laughs> Perfect. That's something that we could have written. But I probably I bet chat GPT probably wrote that. Yeah, probably. Yeah. So they've got this new uh, 
this new company called Sprinkler, who has a toxicity model <laughs> and runs uh, runs tweets through it to find out how toxic they are and how mm-hmm. these slurs are being used. And this is all just – this is also theater so Elon Musk can call people pedos. That's all it is. <laughs> That's all this is. Yeah. Elon said, find me a loophole. OK. Well, mm, is it hate speech? No, he's just a dick. OK. You can call him a dick. Done. OK. <laughs> <So, laughs> Fucking Christ. <laughs> Unbelievable. This episode is brought to you by Delete Me. Delete Me is a hands-free subscription service that takes care of removing personal info that gets sold online. Delete Me's mission is simple, to remove customers' information from search results. They believe in the right to own, manage, and remove our personal information. Their experts remove your data from Google and over 100 data brokers all year long. And the best part is you'll get a privacy report within just seven days. I've been playing whack-a-mole with these data jerks for years, and now I don't have to anymore. I just let Delete Me handle it so I can sleep a little easier at night. And we've got a special offer for you. Use the code GOG at joindeleteme.com slash GOG to get 20% off all their consumer privacy plans. Trust me, you don't want to miss out on this. And Delete Me is all about helping you take control of your online privacy. They're constantly evolving and improving to stay ahead of the game. Here's how it works. You submit your personal information, and Delete Me experts find and remove it from search engines. It's that simple. They also scan and delete your data every three months and even provide custom removal requests and awesome customer support. I choose Delete Me because they're always updating their services and ensuring my privacy is protected. They offer regular, transparent reporting and focus on data security. Plus, their services are available not just in the U.S., but also in a growing list of countries. So if you're ready to take control of your online privacy, head over to joindeleteme.com slash GOG and use the code GOG for 20% off. Trust me, it's a game changer. This episode is brought to you by Collide. Our sponsor Collide has some big news. If you're an Okta user, they can get your entire fleet to 100% compliance. How? If a device isn't compliant, the user can't log into your cloud apps until they've fixed the problem. It's that simple. Collide patches one of the major holes in zero trust architecture, device compliance. Without Collide, IT struggles to solve basic problems like keeping everyone's OS and browser up to date. Unsecured devices are logging into your company's apps because there's nothing to stop them. Collide is the only device trust solution that enforces compliance as part of authentication, and it's built to work seamlessly with Okta. The moment Collide's agent detects a problem, it alerts the user and gives them instructions to fix it. If they don't fix the problem within a set time, they're blocked. Collide's methods mean fewer support tickets, less frustration, and most importantly, 100% 100% fleet compliance. Visit Clyde.com slash GOG to learn more or book a demo. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash GOG. Media Candy. In a, a bit late, but at least they're actually super creative and funny, so maybe this will be good news. The South Park creators use ChatGPT to co-write an episode about AI. I have not watched South Park in a good decade, if not more than that, but mm-hmm. I've always consistently been very impressed by them, thought the show was absolutely hilarious. When I did watch it, they're very funny people. So I'm hoping they did some. I might actually have to go back and watch this one. Uh, released on March 9th, 2023, the fourth episode of season 26, titled Deep Learning, sees students at South Park Elementary discover the new technology that can write their homework. The episode ends with the credits saying, written by Trey Parker and ChatGPT, although knowing the creators of South Park, this could be sarcasm. The credit yeah. also explains that some of the voices in the episode, namely the voice of ChatGPT itself, were created using Play.ht's AI-powered text-to-voice generator. So, Ooh, fun. I have to check them out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, maybe I'll have to watch that and, Yeah, you tell me how it is. I'm not going to waste my okay. time. <laughs> And if you're tired of TV providers advertising one price but charging another thanks to hidden fees, a tale as old as time, I'm sorry, my father was complaining about this about 25 years ago, so not much has ever been done, but you might not have to put up with that practice for much longer. I'd say this is also 20 years off personally, but okay. The FCC has proposed a requirement that cable and satellite TV services clearly and prominently display the true cost of service both in their marketing and on subscriber bills. 
They can't mask programming costs as fees that only show up on your bill, hiding them behind vague or potentially misleading terms. This is intended to help would-be customers make truly informed choices about TV subscriptions, including comparisons with streaming services. Uh, This comes months after President Biden called on government agencies to fight junk fees and otherwise demand more transparent pricing for services and events. So basically broadband nutrition labels that display prices and typical performance. Uh, I would love to see this happen, but I can see companies have already gotten ahead of this. I was uh, looking at uh, my mom still subscribes to Spectrum Cable, but we have her on a bunch of apps now anyways. And so we was trying to figure out there's a few channels that she would like to keep for cable. Uh, guess what they do now? There's no there's no small packages there. There are they provide two packages. And That's they're both it. very expensive and involve almost every <laughs> single channel. It's basically, do you speak Spanish in your house or do you speak English? So there's no menu anymore. <laughs> there's no choosing. It's basically just, here's the fire hose. That's what you get. Nice. Nice. So they've gotten ahead of that. Well, I, you know, see, this is fine. Cable and TV providers, great. Uh, you know, can somebody please get on the fact that unlimited downloads are not unlimited downloads on my internet broadband package? <laughs> You know, I mean, the fact that they still are allowed to use the words unlimited for anything, anything when it comes to, you know, uh, Internet usage still drives me crazy. So, yeah, this is fine. But, uh, yeah, it's it's just baby steps, I guess. Yeah. Well, if you're looking to cut the cord, the best live TV streaming services in 2023 list is out by Engadget. So you could take a look at that. But again, good luck. Good luck. (laughs) Just good luck. (laughs) Uh, I found this one. Apple TV Plus global market share shrinks and platform is overtaken by Paramount Plus. So we have, we've got a rundown here of all of the uh, the most popular uh, mm-hmm. streaming services. So uh, we've got Netflix at number one with 23 percent. Amazon no Prime Video at 20 percent. Mm-hmm. Disney Plus at 18 mm-hmm. percent. HBO Max at 9 percent. Paramount Plus at 7 percent. Apple TV Plus at 5 percent and others at 21 percent. Now, the thing is here, like, OK, so – Apple TV Plus could still be gaining actual subscribers but losing market share because everybody subscribes to everything else. Out of the top six on this list, I subscribe to every fucking one of them. Yeah, my, my every guess one is, of them. My guess is all of them have grew. <laughs> Yeah, because people are now Netflix, obviously juggernaut internationally. I'm actually surprised it's a, it's it's low at that low because just internationally, it's it's the top dog. Yeah. Amazon Prime Video, that is 100 percent just because people are prime subscribers. Right. That's, that's, for, that's you're, a freebie. You're, that's a gimme. you're paying you're paying more for your two day delivery or same day delivery. And maybe you're watching Prime Video. So that's kind of a bullshit metric. Um, Paramount Plus, I'm surprised is doing as well as it is. But then again, not. I mean, if you're into Star Trek, but how many people are really into Star Trek? If that's where you go. What they have been doing a really good job on is adding in sports recently. They've got a lot mm. of soccer that they put in, a lot of football. Uh, they're getting into that game. So that's that probably makes a lot of sense as to why they're doing as well as they are. So Apple TV's got the prestige programming right now, though, man. I'll tell you that. So I, I expect to see that go up as... as uh, the problem with Apple TV, and it's the reason I have not watched Ted Lasso, which we're about to get to is you kind of need an Apple device. Yes, I guess I haven't even tried. Well, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm the one to talk. I've never even tried it on a PC. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah. (laughs) So, I mean, you can go to the website. I don't know if there are third party apps. I need to look into that, but I I didn't watch Ted Lasso because I was at my mom's. My mom doesn't have an Apple TV. No, I don't have Apple TV plus hooked up to her TV yet. So anyways. What kind of son does not buy their mother a, an Apple TV? Come because on, man. she knows what she knows, and she <laughs> this does is not just want for you, man. New things. <laughs> yeah, this is just for when you come to visit. Come on, yeah, this is not it's for a whole her. other thing you. connected that she might actually end up on somehow when she just presses buttons and then. Oh, I you just plug call. it in when you get there. You keep it in a drawer and blah, you pull blah, blah, it out when you get there. Come on, man. Blah, blah, blah. So much work. <laughs> you know what Scott. I'm really surprised is not on this list though is Hulu. Ooh. Well, it's right. Okay. Internationally, this is where it gets complicated. Internationally, Hulu is part of Disney Plus. Oh, oh, that's right. So Hulu is only a separate entity in the U.S. now. Okay. And I don't even know how long that's going to be because I did log into Hulu with my Disney Plus account the other day. So, (laughs) hmm. Okay. So, who knows? Uh, Spotify has reportedly spent less than the 10% of its Joe Rogan apology fund. 
I didn't know there was an apology fund. Oh, yeah. When they got all that heat, they put $100 million into a creator equity fund, a pool meant to foster diversity in podcasts and music in its first year of operation. The company reportedly planned to spend the whole fund over three years, but hasn't had a solid structure for approving spending, has been slow to hire staff. Changing priorities, such as not spending that money, have also hurt the project, <laughs> insiders say. The firm established the fund after the artist led backlash to Joe Rogan, allegedly enabled the spreading of COVID-19 vaccine information and all the other bullshit that he does. Mm -hmm. um, they've repeatedly defended signing him, pulled some of the episodes, blah. We all know about all this crap. But uh, yeah. yeah, they've they've spent <laughs> – Spotify has followed up saying the company has spent more than 10% of the fund. The company has not provided a specific figure. Right, because – So they've so, spent 11%. 11% and, you know, they're just basically keeping interest on the rest of that nine, or $89 million that's sitting in the bank right now. Yeah. And that's why they're waiting the three years. So it doubles and, you know, doubles yeah. from the interest and then they can spend it. They're just waiting to the end. Yep, it's all CFO trickery, just like we were talking about earlier. Yep, the, the uh, F in CFO is for fuckery. Yes, yes. And just speaking of Spotify, the new Depeche Mode album, Memento Mori, came out today. I listened to it briefly. I am very happy and also sad because I have a feeling this is the last one. Okay, okay. Mm. I'll, have, I'll have to give it a listen later. Mm. Uh, Ted Lasso, you said you're not watching it, so this is going to be a very brief <laughs> review of Ted Lasso. Uh, well, we're uh, back home now. I plan to watch it soon. I just haven't yet, so. All right. There's only two out. It'll take you take you two hours. Yeah. If that. Um loving it. I think it's I think it's off to a good start. Good. So good. Yep. Very For excited. the final season. Yes, they did it. Yes. It is good. the final season. Good. Uh speaking of finals, Picard mm -hmm. in its yes. final season. Now yes. before we start before we get into <laughs> season three here mm -hmm. there's only one explanation for picard season two compared to season three they they were fucking with us that's it they were just <laughs> fucking with us and and giving us the low the world's lowest expectations for season three so when season three came out mm -hmm. mind blown and fan service through the roof yeah so, i almost felt like there was a little too much fan service in this last one and not enough not enough grip gripping on the edge of your seat stuff i don't know i liked it i, I it look i'm good. all in for this one i'm just smiling when it's on i'm like come on what's next what's i hear next? your i hear your voice in the back of my mind every time now when i'm starting to go oh come on and then i was just just enjoy the ride yep just sure of course it. data's back why not enjoy you knew it was coming you knew it was coming <laughs> i swear to god will wheaton's gonna show up and save the day i just got a feeling i got yeah. a feeling he, he will appear everybody else has yep. oh by the way we i don't know if we talked about it but ensign Rowe. Yeah. I love her. <laughs> I always have. <laughs> yeah, that was a that was a nice one. That was a yeah. nice one. But yeah, I'm loving it so much. So much. It's fun. Uh I The Last of Us has wrapped up. I gave okay. it a couple of weeks to finish up. Um it was solid. It was definitely, definitely solid. Yeah, um, everybody loves it. Yeah, it's it's well worth the watch. It's definitely well worth the watch. And I'm very curious to what they're gonna do for season two. Well, if but, you played the video game, you probably have a good idea. Well, they got it. They're changing things up a bit just because of the way the timelines work. But at least what they did that was really smart is the actress, the main actress, plays like a 14 year old mm -hmm. in the show, but she's actually 19 in real life. So they can age her up pretty seamlessly. So, as right. they say, you don't get the Stranger Things effect. Gotcha. <laughs> um, so that'll be good. Uh, I did watch a bit of Money Shot, the Pornhub story on Netflix yesterday. Mm -hmm. Lasted a about 30 minutes until we got into the the uh, the trip the side trip to Wokistan, as it were <laughs> and then it just got into people bitching about Pornhub and um all the 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 other shit that goes along with it uh, which honestly it's porn in general and the trafficking and all the other shit that goes along with it it's not just Pornhub that it's is a problem it. with that it's yes. all of it but um to wrap it up and say you know the world's trafficking problems are all Pornhub's fault is just you know, it's a stupid argument. Um, it's bad. It's a bad argument. And um, it just took me out of the show and I just turned it off and said, screw it. It wasn't that interesting. Some of the information that these – that the, the quote unquote kids who worked at Pornhub were talking about, they, they were talking about the history of porn and things like that on the internet. And I'm like, you are so far off the mark. <laughs> they As did someone not go who to the source. It, they need, they need yeah. to talk to you. <laughs> Seriously. Seriously, I could, I could, it, it, like at this one point, they were talking about the early days of porn on the internet, but they showed a dial up to a BBS. And I'm like, that's not the internet. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. The internet. <laughs> Words matter. Words matter. Screenshots matter. <laughs> and so do money shots, apparently. But, <laughs> eh, uh, skip it. It's not worth the time. 
And uh, I saw this one, which I thought was very interesting. Beethoven's genome has sequenced for the first time and yields clues on cause of death. Uh, no, it doesn't actually. They still <laughs> don't know what killed him. Uh, it's just interesting. It's an interesting story, what they're doing. Now, if they were going to bring him back Jurassic Park style, fucking sign me up. I'm in for that. Or, That'd be or, great. you know, <laughs> yeah, Keanu shows up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Beethoven. It was Beethoven, uh, right? That they... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> but I have to say, I, I, it just reminded me of Immortal Beloved, which is an underrated Gary Oldman movie, which I think is one of his finer moments in a very good movie from 1994. If you've never seen it, highly recommend uh, grabbing some popcorn and, to and tossing that one on. It was pretty good. It was man, pretty that's good. old. Yeah, 1994, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were. Well, I was 23. <laughs> God damn. And final shout out to uh, the Labors of Hercule podcast with uh, Adam and Frankie, Adam Roche, who does The Secret History of Hollywood, who I'm a huge fan of and have always said that that's one of the most greatest and underrated podcasts out there. Go give him all your monies. Um, but they do the Labors of Hercule podcast, which is all about the TV show Poirot, of which I'm a super fan. Mm -hmm. And when we hang up on this episode today – I am going to be a guest on the Labors of Hercule podcast. Oh, so congratulations. I'm extraordinarily <laughs> excited. I am so amped. So uh, link is in the show notes. Go sign up. It's a great show. Ups and doodads. Sad news, Brian, mm -hmm. which you probably won't give a flying fuck about. Mm -hmm. uh, DP review. Uh, not this, this is not porn. Is this related this to Pornhub? No, this is not Pornhub. This okay. is not a Pornhub thing, which would have been a great name for porn <laughs> review site but no uh this is digital photography uh so that's the dp and the dp review um they are closing down so amazon apparently doesn't feel like paying the bill for it anymore since they own it uh which is sad dp review has been around forever and has the best reviews of any digital photography gear that you could ever want i use it when I'm, whenever i'm getting a new camera do it any kind of uh checking out to see what they recommend and don't recommend about different cameras but it is going away and I'm very sad oh, about that. Yeah. Um, but I, who buys – I can see it. I mean not that many people buy digital yeah, SLRs or DSLRs anymore. They're or, basically you know. reviewing iPhones at this point. That's the problem. So <laughs> uh, Petapixel is picking up two of the – Petapixel? Uh, yeah, Petapixel is still around. Oh, not another Pixel, porn arm thing. Not Pito, yeah, okay. No, no, no. Not, pe not <laughs> Petapixel. It's a different one too. Um so they're going to be picking up some of the uh, YouTubers that do uh, videos for DP Review. Um, but uh, yeah, Petapixel is still a solid site. I actually get a lot of news that we talk about here on the show from there. So check that right. one out. But yeah, it's just a sad day. Sad day. <laughs> All right. Well, Adobe is bringing generative AI features to Photoshop After Effects and Premiere Pro. Fuck it. So stop. They, here we go. On Tuesday, stop. Adobe revealed its next generation of AI features, a family of generative models the company has collectively dubbed Firefly, the first of which will generate both images and font effects. I love this particular sentence. With it, would-be digital artists are no longer limited by their <laughs> subpar dexterity or sheer lack of artistic talent. They will be able to speak into existence professional quality illustrations using only the power of their words. Which they got from ChatGPT because they don't know how to spell. Yes, I think so as well. I love that it's called Firefly. That means it's going to get canceled after the first season and we never have to work on it again. <laughs> and it's not just text image. The multimodal nature means that video, audio, video illustrations and 3D models can all be generated via the system and enough verbal gymnastics. Make me a 3D model of a penis, please. <laughs> Can't wait. <laughs> and then you get one of Donald Trump. Perfect. <laughs> So uh, according to the company, the model is trained on hundreds of millions of images from Adobe stock photo catalog, openly licensed content and stuff from the public domain, virtually guaranteeing the model won't result in lawsuits as Stable Diffusion did with the Getty unpleasantness. It also helps that stock photographers and artists will be compensated bullshit for the use of their works <laughs> in training these AIs. Yeah, so, yeah sure we'll they will. I'm sure, sure they, they will. will. Uh, and interesting news, Duolingo is building a music learning app. Uh, so you probably know Duolingo as the app where you can uh, learn new languages or at least familiarize, familiarize, uh, familiarize yourself with the local <laughs> tongue, speaking of Me tongues, tongue <laughs> of a place you're visiting. Uh, I've actually used it before. I was brushing up on German before a trip a while back. It was, it's a great app. I liked it. Um, you know, I was it. That's right. But according to a job posting, uh, a small team that's currently working to build an app for teaching music is looking for an expert in music education who combines both theoretical knowledge of relevant learning science research and hands-on teaching experience. Whoever we'll gets the job will be in charge of making sure the app is well-grounded in learning science. 
Uh, so it's kind of interesting. I mean, I, I, I love all this stuff that's out there about teaching music, uh, particularly as my son is getting to the age where I definitely want him to start learning all that sort of stuff. So very cool. I hope this comes out soon. Yeah, me too. I will sign up for this in a heartbeat. Yeah, I would. Very cool. You know me, I've always wanted to learn music and haven't found the right tools to do it yet. Yeah. <laughs> so I have been playing around with uh, my, uh, was it uh, Lumi keyboard? Because yeah. got, I got the keyboard and they got the app and started to play around with it and just get my finger dexterity. And that's uh, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. But I would like something that actually teaches me music theory along with it, not just basically rock band for piano. So right. I'm, I'm actually looking forward to this. This is this yeah. be cool. I, I hope they come out with something soon and I hope it's cool. So I, I was definitely a fan of their language product, even though I didn't stick with it. Uh, but people love it. So. Cool, cool. Uh, this is a really funny little one that uh, I just discovered yesterday because somebody sent me a message in Instagram and they sent me a voice message in the DMs. And I'm like, what? You know what They're I like, do hey, when I get you... – well, you know what I do when I get those? <laughs> Delete. Delete them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the same as you get them in a text message. It's like, why are, just, why, no. why are you doing this? Yeah. <laughs> why are you doing this? I just didn't know you could do it. So I thought it was kind of neat. Yeah, it's more shit for meta to scrape, but you know. It's it's harder for them to do that than it is to actually scrape the the actual text that you type in, which they probably do anyway. So, yeah, give, give also up if you also think harder for the person you're sending it to, which is why don't ever send me these. Send me text. Thank you. Yes, yes, please, please. Oh, they're so stupid. Um, I did pick up this little thing from Moft M O P H T. Mm -hmm. I, this is one of those things that comes back to uh, the old Instagram, actually, because I get the ads for them all the damn time. There's these little uh, magnetic laptop stickies that go on the back of the, the top of your laptop that can hold your iPhone. So you can, right. you know, just flip it up and uh, magnetically attach your iPhone to it. Normally, I'd be like, OK, that's stupid, except for the fact that now you can use your iPhone as a webcam, a really nice webcam. It's, yep. A matter of fact, so they're kind of cool. I mean, it's not cheap with shipping. It was like thirty-two bucks for a little magnet thingy, but I put it on and it works great. Yeah, so. see, that's the thing. I I would happily pay the thirty-two bucks because you know the ten buck version will last a week and just leave sticky crap all over your computer. Exactly. That's why I didn't get the cheap cheap yep. one and yep. or mo and moft moft not phd. Um, they um is it? Let me look at it. Oh yeah, it is moft. <laughs> I got it on my <laughs> laptop right here. I had to go look. Um. Yeah, I wanted to get something that's nice that because it, it does move, you know, it's got like a hinge on or multiple hinges. And I'm like, if you get the cheap one, it's just going to crack and kind of fall yep. apart. Yep. So I just I got the nicer one because if I'm going to be using it a lot, which I plan to because I tested it last night and it works really good. That continuity camera stuff with uh, the iPhone is mm -hmm. really cool. I mean, I, I've got a really good webcam in my laptop because I've got uh, the M1 MacBook Pro, the 14 inch. Yeah. And uh, the webcam in that is really nice, but it's still not as nice as you can get if you have an iPhone. I got a 13 Pro, so the camera on that's much nicer. Um, yeah, 32 bucks, which seems like a lot for a sticker, but <laughs> I would rather pay a little bit more to and have, have it, it work. Not, yeah. Especially since it is literally stuck to my laptop. I don't want to exactly. put some kind of crappy exactly. thing on it. Yeah. And uh, in we've talked about our, our uh, Samsung curved monitors. Yes. Which I love. Oh, I love that. I'm sitting looking at it right now. It is the best monitor I've ever owned in my life. Yes. I actually want another one because right now I've got, um, I finally broke down and found the back plate that you can mount, <laughs> add a VESA mount to it. Yeah. Because I threw mine away because I'm like, when am I ever going to put this thing on a mount? Within 10 minutes of me throwing it away, I'm like, oh man, I could, oh, I really wish I would have You know what's done amazing <laughs> to me about you, Jason? I, I, I have been to multiple of your studios. I've been to your garage. I've been to many of your houses, packed up cameras from 30 years ago that you never touch, gear everywhere, bags of stuff. You keep everything except for the one thing that you actually needed. You know why? Because it wasn't in the studio. It was actually in my paperwork with the manual. So it was not It was not in the place where I'm usually a pack rat. It was in the place where I usually clean it out because I only have so much room for my paperwork. Instead of taking it to the part, the place where I keep all my shit, my pack rat stash, I ended up just throwing it out. And that was a $90 mistake for that little stupid piece of metal. It cost me 90 bucks to replace it. I was going to offer to bring you mine. When you first started complaining about it, because I'm not using it currently yeah. and I have it in my garage, but then I looked up and saw how much it costs and I was like, I don't know if I'm going to continue to use the stand the way it is. I could very well need this monitor plate very soon, so I yes. will not be offering <laughs> 
I wouldn't have taken it from you just for that reason because I'm like, you're going to want it. Yeah. Um, I put it I, – so I've got a vertical two-monitor stand now. And so I have – on the bottom, I have the Samsung monitor. And on top, I've got an LG gaming monitor, 27-inch monitor, um, which is working out great. I posted a picture on Instagram yesterday. Yeah, I saw that. So if you want to cool go see setup. it. Yeah. It works really nice. And – the way the, the, the angles and everything, it works nice because I can put my webcam right in the middle of the Samsung and it's pretty close to like eye line mm-hmm. if, you, if you put the, the things right. Uh, it's a fantastic setup. I would love to have two of the Samsung monitors here though just because. Yeah. Just because. Just those two stacked on top of each other would look so sweet. <laughs> I, I, had, I, was, I shared an office with a guy down the hall who had just that. He had uh, the two Samsung monitors and in the middle he had a DSLR instead of just a regular webcam because it, it, it just what worked for him. And it was perfect. It was a perfect line of sight monitor. But that's why I've got that Insta360 camera now that is much better. That fits right there, and it is it is a great setup. But man, that plate eighty for ninety bucks with shipping it was just like oh that that was painful. But when it got here, the first thing I did was just stop work completely and put it together because it's <laughs> waited so damn long, so long. But yeah, oh, it's so nice, so nice to have this thing finally off the desk. Yeah, we should make sure that we get a a link to the Samsung monitor in our show notes because people have been asking about it on Discord. But I think you posted it there too, so. Yeah. I will I will post a link to it. Yeah. Today's episode is sponsored by Private Internet Access, America's number one virtual private network, also known as a VPN. Even if you use incognito mode, your internet service provider is storing your browsing data and many times even selling it. But Private Internet Access, or PIA, can help. PIA encrypts and reroutes your internet traffic through one of its own servers, hiding your data from your internet service provider or network admin. And with servers in over 75 countries, you can get unrestricted access to geoblock content around the world. PIA comes with an easy-to-use app and browser extensions for all devices, a rock-solid privacy policy, open-source security, advanced customization settings, and it was just ranked the fastest VPN in the world by PCMag. If you sign up with PIA right now, you can take advantage of a special deal only for GOG listeners. By using our link, gog.show slash VPN, you can get complete digital privacy for less than $2 a month, and four extra months for free, which means only one buck ninety eight cents a month and up to eighty three percent off. That's so much more inexpensive than virtually every other VPN on the market. And if you get it right now, you can take PIA's thirty day risk free challenge. You can try it out for thirty days and see if you like it. If not, just return it for a full refund. So go to gog.show/vpn and try out the best VPN on the planet completely risk free. That's gog.show/vpn. The dark side. Ha! With Dave. Welcome back to Security. Ha! With Dave Bittner. Dave is the host of the Cyberware podcast, co-host of the social engineering podcast Hacking Humans with Joe Kerrigan. Dave is also the co-host of Caveat with Ben Yellen, where they discuss law and policy and surveillance and privacy. And the new control. Well, it's not even that new anymore. <laughs> the old copy. <laughs> and About control six loop. In. <laughs> yeah, and control loop where they discuss ICS and OT. Yeah, I by told six you I was months, most the- podcasts have died. So yeah. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Good to be back, gents. Good to be back. Nice. Are you Welcome all uh, to our recombobulated? 10 year anniversary? <laughs> oh, yes. What's that? Welcome to our 10 year anniversary show. Oh, well, we've done nothing special except mention it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's exciting. 10 years is nothing to sniff about. That's a long well, time. It is too long. <laughs> <laughs> when did I join? Like around year six, something like that? Maybe. No, four? you came in about three and a half. Yeah, you've okay. been here a while. <laughs> All right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you've Time been here flies. at least six years. Okay. At least. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I think you were here before Brian had a kid. So I was. Yes. Yes. yes so. <laughs> yeah. So coming up That's on right. seven. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Very nice. Mm-hmm. Only seems like twenty. We yeah. should have self-driving cars by now, the way this is going. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> so. Okay. So, Dave, uh, I see one, you put Mandalorian yeah. check-in here in the in the notes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. yes. I didn't want to bring it up because last time with the Mandalorian, it took you a little while because you had to get sign-off from the whole family. So I wasn't going to push you. Right. You put it in. So where you at? <laughs> <laughs> yes. We are, we are caught up. We are up to date on our Mandalorian. In fact, just last night, we watched the most – recent episode so uh mm-hmm. i can i can talk about mandalorian without risk of 
spoiling it for myself. Okay. So how are you guys feeling about this season so far? I'm one behind, so <laughs> beware oh, the spoilers. Okay. All right. <laughs> you, you missed a pretty exciting episode. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. My feeling is like this is all over the map this 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 season uh but not necessarily in a bad way like Mm -hmm. i like it It, they're filling in some lore i know that there was a lot of talk about oh they're totally gonna retcon snoke and emperor emperor palpatine coming back and all the cloning and all that and i'm like nope they're leaning into it they're leaning into it pretty big they're filling in the backstory here Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. yeah Uh, Yeah. i've liked it. it it's it's been good i i'm curious to see where it's gonna go um i like the fact that it's actually become about mandalorians not just the mandalorian (laughs) right yeah yeah i agree and they they the jumping around is similar to what they did with um book of boba fett where there were some boba fett episodes that were about the mandalorian (laughs) in this (laughs) case there's some there there's some side journeys which um I, i think have been interesting like you say to fill in some backstory and in this most recent one that Jason hasn't seen yet, some interesting backstory filling that I won't uh, spoil. But also, <laughs> Brian, uh, did you catch the um, remarkable uh, cameo? I did. I did. Yeah. I, I felt that was very, <laughs> very fitting for a much maligned actor to, to get a really star turn. <laughs> my, youngest Gibson son said, my, my, young, my youngest son great. said, holy shit. <laughs> so yeah. that was great fun. I thought yeah. so too, and and he did a good job. I thought I was at first. Did. I didn't know, like I because I, I try. I don't read reviews or anything. I, I just go into it, and I, I couldn't quite. I was like, why? Why so familiar? The scenes, mm-hmm. the voice is so familiar in a weird. Mm-hmm. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I also thought they did a really good job of when they did kind of some flashbacky stuff of having everything feel like the place they were flashing back to in the timeline and the production style, the the types of shots they selected and even the way they did the special effects and compositing just felt like of that time. So mm-hmm. really nice attention to detail. Yeah. Yeah. I have to say, I, I don't know if you've been keeping up with the Bad Batch or even watching it. Um, mm. My, I have not. Um, yeah. Well, uh, my impre- I, I was enjoying the Bad Batch until – live action came back and I've been putting it on and uh, they're also trying to fill in some of the lore They're that's kind of, they're, they're both kind of contemporary and trying to, uh, they're, they're simpatico in the story that they're trying to tell from different angles. I just can't get into it anymore. It's like the animation is fine. It's just, I prefer live action. And I found myself mm. just kind of unable to stay away from my phone and looking at other things while the bad batch is on and then looking up 10 minutes later going, what the hell just happened? And then going, ah, I don't care. It doesn't matter. And, yeah. uh, but I don't do that with the Mandalorian. So. Mm-hmm. And that's what happened to me initially with the bad batch. I, I gave it a couple of episodes and I just couldn't get uh, hooked on it. It just didn't yeah. stick for me. Yeah. Uh, I'm yeah. there now too. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I wanted to do a quick little bit of follow up here. Well, actually, before we do that, Jason, we we skipped you there. What are your thoughts on Mando? I uh, loving it so far. I thought that they the uh, the previous episode before the the current one where they were in Coruscant, I I was just like, man, they spent a lot of budget on that episode. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. They yeah. you know things could have probably look good. Spent- they yeah. looked really good, but it was like, you know, a side story. And I'm just like, uh, why are they spending all this money on this story? I'm like, come on. Well, because yeah. that's going to be the main story. I think okay. that's where we're headed. So got yeah. it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm I loving it right. so far. I'm 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 glad it's back. So yeah. yeah another thing we noticed uh watching yesterday or the most recent episode was that uh it was short. It was just over mm-hmm. a half hour long and some of the episodes can stretch to nearly an hour. And I think that's an interesting aspect of this type of storytelling and, and being not being bound to any sort of network schedule that your episodes can be as long as they need to be. And that's yeah. fine. <clears throat> or as short as they need to be. You don't have to pad them out if you've got just a singular tale to tell and you can do it in 30 minutes. You do it, right? Like mm-hmm. no filler. So Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Just I think it's an interesting evolution of what we're seeing here. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I want to do just a little uh, bit of quick follow up, something I neglected to talk about last time when we were following up after my vacation. Um, I want to talk about rental cars. So 
I don't know if you guys have rented any cars lately. Brian, you may have. I you... have, and I, I'm curious <laughs> to see where you go with this. My 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 line right now is a a um a service primed for disruption. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so so we got on our airplane. We all piled into uh, our flight to Florida from Baltimore, and that all went fine. And we went down there and got to Orlando International Airport, which is a, a fine, fine airport. And um, while we were getting our luggage, my wife rent, went and got the rental car, uh, and we rented a minivan mm-hmm. um, because there are five of us. And so could that have ended up being right. four on the way back, but luckily that worked out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's exactly. Right. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Well, also I wanted to point out that I think for a lot, a lot of folks um, underestimate the size of the vehicle they need because they think, oh, there are five of us. There are five seats in this sedan. Five but then they people's forget luggage. That, it, luggage. Yes, <laughs> yes, everybody has luggage, <laughs> right? <laughs> so. With a minivan, you've got plenty of room for everybody and their luggage, and you're not – nobody has to hold their luggage on their lap between the, the airport and the hotel or wherever you're yep. staying. Agreed. So we got the minivan, and uh, so my wife pulls up at the airport, and we load up, and we get in, and we're headed off to our place, and we put it in the GPS to get going, and – let me back up and say that my wife is moderately ADHD. Okay. And uh, I'm not telling any tales out of school. She'd be the first to tell you that this is something that she deals with and contends with and, and sometimes struggles with and on other time, at other times it is, it is her superpower. Um, so she's driving and we're on our way from the airport to where we're staying. And let me tell you, it was a terrifying car ride from my point of view. (laughs) Well, it's not that it's Florida. It's that because we're in a new car that she is not familiar with and there are so many little shiny objects in this car and she can't (laughs) resist any of them, right? So it's like, oh, let me – oh, let me turn the air conditioning on. Oh, what? Oh, that triggered the touchscreen. Let me do this. Oh, Oh, what's this? Did you notice that you can have temperature control zones? (laughs) (laughs) Right, exactly. Watch the road, honey. Dear, watch the road. Oh, what's this? Oh, the stereo is integrated into this. Oh, can I connect my phone? Watch the road, honey. Watch the road. You know, (laughs) So a couple of things I wanted to come at here. One is that I think the complexity of cars has gone way up. Yep. Uh, just in that the variety of things that you're going to be confronted with when you get into a car that you're unfamiliar with, I think it's a much broader spectrum than what we had to deal with in our younger days when you well, when yeah, we were there all was coming a, and there, driving and everything was there, mechanical. There, there was a radio, there was an ashtray, and then you could plug right. your thing into the cigarette lighter. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> there was a shift knob either in the middle or on the steering column. Yes. Right? Uh, we, turning we had, the headlights on was in the same place. Mm-hmm. We had AM mm-hmm. and FM. Mm-hmm. Well, now you're right. you're you're driving a computer. That's and there are buttons everywhere, and everybody's layout and UI is different. So, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So this was something that uh, made me grumpy, and um, really from that point on, once we got to the place, I did most of the driving after that because <laughs> that way she could sit in the passenger seat and play to her heart's content with all the different <laughs> buttons and things and and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's not easy. I mean, it really takes – there are so many depths of menus you need to get into. Just getting – figuring out the HVAC, figuring out um, the headlight situation. I remember the first night we were leaving uh, one of the parks we were at and, and it was dusk and and we're just like, okay, we need to turn the lights on. Not sure how to do that. Don't Most know. of them are automatic <laughs> now. Yeah, really? Well, so, okay, that brings up another point uh, <laughs> in modern cars, which is that I see m- way more people driving around with their lights off than right. I used to. And I think part of that is because of uh, daytime running lights. So they see light coming out of the front of their car and they think my lights are on. Right. Meanwhile, the back of their car is completely dark. But I also think it's because computerized, display-driven uh, speedometers and fuel and all that kind of stuff, they're always illuminated now. Yeah. So when you see that, you see it lit up. And if you're an old school driver, you think, oh, that's lit up. My lights must be on. And they're not. They're not necessarily on. Right. 
Yeah, most so. uh, my last couple new cars when I get them, there's the one time I touch the lights is when I take the knob and I turn it to auto, and that's it. The only time right. I ever have to touch it again <laughs> is if I hit it with my knee and I start to drive, and I'm like, why can't I see the road? Oh, okay, I, I must have hit it, and then I turn it back to auto, and <laughs> mm-hmm. that's it. You know, you never have to touch it again. Yeah, that's true. So my wife is shopping for a new car, and and her car is about ten years old, so it doesn't have many of the the new things, and she's actually not happy about having to deal with all of the new stuff because, you know, a lot of stuff you have no choice. Things have moved yeah. along. And yep. so um, the types of buttons uh, that you can get and all that sort of thing, touch screens, um, she's really not excited because she knows her own, <laughs> her own tendencies. <laughs> Limitations, <laughs> tendencies, yeah, however you want to say yeah. it. And yep. uh, she's afraid of being overwhelmed. I tell well, you what, tell her to, to get do. a Jeep. Because my Jeep has nothing in it. It's got the tiniest little touch screen <laughs> and it is it is like – I'm, I'm surprised it doesn't have cranks on the windows, honestly. Uh-huh. It is very my, anti-technical. My last Jeep did. Oh. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, I, the only thing I can say uh, is obviously there's a big difference between a rental car and a car you purchase. So she will have the yeah. ability to sit in the garage and familiarize herself with the mechanics and the, everything prior to hitting the road which is nice and dial everything mm-hmm. in. Um, I would not buy a car any. Well, I have an iPhone. I don't know if your wife does, but I would not buy a car yes. anymore that doesn't have uh, CarPlay built in. It's such a convenience. Right. It's perfect. Takes care of 90% of the problems. You're pretty much left figuring out HVAC and, HVACs and lighting. So, you know. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So my rental car thing is is a bit more of a, of a frustration and anger uh, than yours. Mm. Yours is about the cars itself. Mine is about the companies. Um, my wife is, has her own, um, also I would consider sometimes limitation, but sometimes superpower in that she never wants to spend a dollar more than she should ever have to spend ever and will invest countless hours that she could have been making a lot more money in trying to save $5. Um, Mm. and, and one of the ways that she has done that is with our travels. She has, she has researched different programs. She is a, she became a member of a particular car rental thing out of like a gold level, which is part of a bigger package, which also ties into hotels and blah, blah, blah. Cause this is how far down the, down the, down the well she goes on this stuff. But on the plus (laughs) side, you know, gold member at, at a prestigious major, major car rental company. To the point where when we land, we don't have to go to the desk. There is a board. It has a name. We are supposed to be able to pick any car that we would like in the area and just be able to land and drive off. It has yet to ever work out that way. Ever. (laughs) Um, Not once. Would it by chance be Hertz? Because I was a gold member on Hertz. It yes, would. okay. Yes, I can I can corroborate this. I can corroborate this. I was a Hertz gold member. And many, many times when I used to travel, they were supposed to have the car gassed up and ready for me to go. Not once was it exactly no, not the way once. it was supposed to be. So the, there is yeah. a board and our name is on it. And then we get in a line and we don't get to walk down the aisle and pick our car. We wait for a car to be driven up to us. And then we can say, yes, I would like this car or no, I don't really like this car. I would need this a car that does this, which everybody in line is doing, thus making the line impossible. Just give us mm. – let us walk down the aisle like you promised and pick whatever's mm-hmm. there. Anyways, mm-hmm. that's pickup. Whatever. Fine. Drop off. <laughs> oh, dear. Here we go. <laughs> now, drop off is supposed to be you don't talk to anybody. You, you pull the car up. You leave the key in it and you can just walk away. And, you know, <laughs> if you're supposed to have the gas filled up, you're supposed to have the gas filled up. And if they don't, if you, if you didn't, they're going to charge you for it. Understood. Got it. We've done this every time. Every time they've charged us for something that was a bullshit charge. Every time. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm starting to wonder if that's actually their business model. If they know that most of these people that are at this level are probably traveling for a company. It's, it's company-sponsored travel. They probably never get the receipt. It goes to accounts receivable at some big corporation. Thus, if I charge you an extra day, which is what they've done to us twice now, a full extra day, it's just going to get lost in the shuffle and paid by the company. We have had to call every single time to say, that's fucking bullshit. You charged us for an extra day. We now take pictures of the dash, showing the gas, showing the date, and showing the time of drop-off. So when inevitably we get charged more than we should be, we just send them the photo. This is when the car was dropped off. You bastards. (laughs) <laughs> wow <laughs> and do they immediately back down they do 
They do. There's no argument whatsoever, which makes me think that this is an institutional thing that they do. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's a way to make some extra money. I, and I think you're onto something that if, if if these are mostly corporate users, then yeah, it probably doesn't get noticed. It's not worth someone's totally time lost to in the to, shuffle. Yeah. Yeah, to chase down. Yep. Huh. That's what we like to call bullshit. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure where we are when it comes to rental car inventory or anything like that. I know there were all kinds of problems during the pandemic, but at least on our recent trip, we had no trouble getting a car and we got the car that we had reserved. So uh, that was all good. I don't I don't think we had any – well, uh, to, so now, now, now I'm going to go back and look at the receipt. <laughs> so I don't As you know. should. As you should. <laughs> yes. I don't know. It's – oh, boy. Yeah. No, the, the the inventory seems to be back. That doesn't seem to be an issue either. It's just the it's the process of supposedly something that we paid more for and were an esteemed. I I, th- I can't help but feel it would have been faster if we had picked a specific car and we just knew we were getting that car and go. Not the you can pick from anything that's available. Blah blah blah. Because that never mm-hmm. works out. So mm-hmm. yeah. Mm. Anyways, All disrupt right. it. Disrupt it. Silicon Valley. Here's something to disrupt. <laughs> yeah, I wonder how you would do that. It was something but like a mix between Uber and a rental car company. Yeah, mm. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. know. It's interesting. Um, I do have one uh, little bit of security uh, news here that I thought was interesting. As, as much as we've been talking about chat GPT lately and, and mm-hmm. as much as it's a media darling, um, it seems as though one of the – uh, bad actors, a group called Black Mamba, which, by the way, is probably my favorite poisonous snake. Um, because, also Kobe okay. Bryant's nickname. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys know what uh, sets the Black Mamba apart from all of the other snakes out there? I did see Kill Bill, but I forgot. Highest scoring record many seasons in a row for the Lakers. <laughs> <laughs> all right beyond that uh it nope. is the world's it is the world's fastest snake mm. oh well so in a foot race the black mamba would probably beat you well um, not technically in a foot race they don't have feet <laughs> point brian <laughs> touche <laughs> In a slither race. Uh, right. Of slither which, race. admittedly, humans are not very good at or fast at. Yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> evidently, black mambas are very fast. So this uh, group, Black Mamba, they're doing something called polymorphic malware, which is where... Well, that sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> just wait for it. Uh, I, so, I can just tell right now what it is. That's not good. <laughs> Go ahead. Right. So what you do is, uh, instead of having your malware installer just downloads something from your storage bucket or whatever uh, from your server to install on the victim's machine, what happens is once you get purchase on someone's network, um, you assemble the malware from whole cloth new onto their system in a way that it has never been assembled before. And that way, anything um, that's using any sort of pattern matching won't recognize it because it's new and it's never been used before. Right. So what they're u- doing is they're using ChatGPT. They're reaching out to ChatGPT to generate the code remotely in a novel way each time on the fly for this malware. Mm-hmm. So every time it gets installed, it's different. The, the uh, antivirus has never seen it before. And so it doesn't get flagged. Wow. That is, smart, uh, huh? That's smart. And uh, yeah. yeah, way to go with those guardrails, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. But I suppose if it's just little bits of benign code that are different enough to fool the pattern ma- recognition. Uh, you exactly. Would never, yeah. There's nothing malicious being generated by chat GPT. Right. Yeah. Right. So right. It's, what are you going to do? It's just generating the parts of the, the sort of housekeeping parts of the code. Yeah. Yep. But. In a, each time in a novel way. Mm. Uh, yeah. So Great. I don't know how you fight against it. I mean, the, the, <laughs> the, the companies, you know, say that, you know, you look for behavioral things of all the – if all of a sudden your, your files start uh, being encrypted or, you know, network activity changes, that sort of thing. But the point here is that it it's de- defeats any sort of pattern matching right. um, antivirus. <clears throat> Whack-a-mole so, continues. There you go. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, last but not least, I put in a, a lovely little documentary here from PBS 
Uh, it's called Meredith Wilson, America's Music Man. And it's a lovely little documentary about Meredith Wilson, who's the person who wrote The Music Man. Um, his musical history, his life story touches so many famous musicians that you've heard of. Um, and uh, it's just a, a lovely little gentle little documentary about his life. And if you're at all into that sort of Americana, it's funny when we were at Disney World um, – couple of weeks ago, I, I was I was struck by how many of the tunes that they play on Main Street mm -hmm. are Meredith Wilson tunes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I it's grew kinda... up listening to the Main Street music and all that. So I love this stuff. Yeah. 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 So a nice little documentary. Uh, it's uh, available for free on PBS's website. So if this is your thing, I recommend it. It's uh, probably about a half hour long, worth your time. Very cool. Oh, by the way, I don't know if you were aware uh, of this, but did you know that um, John Williams actually did all the music for Star Wars Land? I did. Yes, I did. I, well, I, I so I'm aware of that because uh, last time we talked, you recommended that, uh, oh, you watched that documentary. Okay. I watched about half of it because it's yeah. an hour and a half long. I, it's an hour uh, and a half commercial. but <laughs> <laughs> Right. So uh, I watched the first half of it. And then, so I did get to the part where John Williams was talking about it. Yeah. And very cool. Yeah. It is very cool. I, I wonder – so you guys have probably noticed too, like at the head end of like shows like The Mandalorian, they have that new little Star Wars logo thing that they run where they show yes. all the different silhouettes mm -hmm. of different characters. And it seems to me like they're deliberately not using John Williams' Star Wars theme. And yeah, I'm guessing that's just a, so they don't have to pay him? Well, he's also 975 years old, I think. It's a. It's also a process of like maybe we need to start to move the music away from such the distinctive John Williams style because he will not be with us forever. Yeah, yeah. I think it might point. be a part of that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, hmm. yeah. I think he did the the coming Indiana, Indiana Jones movie. So I believe he did. So yeah, I'm looking forward. Might to Might be that. his last thing. Could yeah. be. Certainly, hmm. probably within the Harrison Ford universe. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. The, the right. Harrison Ford MCU or whatever we call that. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. <laughs> Until we All get right. uh, John Williams GPT and then it, we well, just have music yeah, forever. Uh, yes. <laughs> That's right. That's do right. us a Write theme. A do us a theme in the style of John Williams, please. <laughs> it's only a matter of time. Yep. That's right. Speaking of time, I think we're up. We're okay. out of okay. time. So. Very good. Thanks for joining us again, Dave, and uh, go on a vacation more because uh, we got more feedback about your vacation notes than uh, anything we've had in a long time. People really <laughs> okay. enjoyed that. Well, well if good. we can, we'll if we can a... mine vacations for content, I'll start. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> start a, a GoFundMe yes. <laughs> for our vacations. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, guys. All right. See you next Bye, time. everybody. Closing shout out. Over at Patreon, we've got Alec and Robert. Welcome to the team, Alec and Robert. Thank you. Over at PayPal, we've got Brian, John, Mike, Tom, Joseph, Mark, and Humphrey. Woo! -hoo. And over at the tip jar, we've got Daryl, Ross, and Karen. And for the obligatory announcement, yes, on Patreon, if you sign up for as little as $3 a month, you do get the episodes a little bit early and ad-free and in high res, res, res. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and thank you all for your donations. Uh, even though we read names off every single week, we are still underfinancialized. Yes, we are. So we appreciate Pathetically it. Pathetically underfinancialized. <laughs> we have a new five-star review from David, longtime listener. Listen every weekend to protect my sanity. Love the show. Each week is a great summary of the week's highlights in tech news, the world, and stuff going on. Dave Bittner's recent review of his trip to Walt Disney World and Star Wars Land was awesome. Keep up the great work and stay both healthy and grumpy. Would not want to have the two of you disappear. Well, we don't want to either. Except no, for the fact that we're under-financialized and maybe this isn't financially <laughs> worth it. Then we'll disappear. <laughs> then we'll disappear. <laughs> uh, yeah. But, I mean, this is why we gave up on security, ha. Huh? If you want security, you listen to Dave's other podcasts. Uh, it's more fun for us to shoot the shit. So Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Every now and again, we'll throw in some security Every stuff if, it, yeah. if, it, if, if, if there's time. <laughs> but, oh, man. Um, sad news. Uh, Lance Reddick died this week. Uh, he was a fantastic actor. I think I first ran into him on Spartacus, mm -hmm. also known as Spartacus Tits and Sand on Showtime. <laughs> it was a great show. It was a fantastic there show. There was such a good run of shows that were like done in period times that just involved nudity. <laughs> yep. And Xena. Don't forget Xena was in that too. 
yep. Lucy Lawless. Yeah, yep. so. um, culminating in Game of Thrones, which just kind of gave up on plot yeah. and just showed nudity constantly. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, pretty much. They they certainly didn't uh, work on the writing, that's for sure. Well, not by the last few seasons. No, they did not. But and anyway, it was uh, very sad. He was very young and very surprising because mm-hmm. I was I was recently watching him in the Bosch series. Right, that was the last time I saw him. But uh, yeah, he will be missed. All right. Until next time, I'm Brian Schulmeister. And I'm Jason DeFilippo. Thanks for listening to Grumpy Old Geeks over the years. If you enjoy the show, visit GOG.show slash donate to help us keep the lights on and help financialize the show. <laughs> we'll love you forever. You can also help us out by sharing the show with your friends and enemies. It's easy and absolutely free. Show notes for this episode are at GOG.show slash 594. From there, you can find links to everything we talked about in this episode, as well as links to our swag and Discord channel if you want to buy some stuff or chat with us and other show fans. You can also head over to GOG.show slash contact and send us your feedback or questions that we can read on the air. And if you're so inclined, please head over to GOG.show slash review and toss us a snarky review and preferably five stars. Stay grumpy, and we'll see you in another ten years. Sometimes during Christmas, something magical happens. Hey, Cricket customers. The Max with Ads plan is included with the Cricket $60 Unlimited plan at no additional cost. And this holiday season, Max is the one to watch when you're feeling festive. Son of a nutcracker. Cozy up to all the holiday classics like Elf, 8-Bit Christmas, and the Harry Potter 8 film collection. Just log in with your Cricket username and password to experience Max on all your favorite devices. Phone plan streams and standard definition programming subject to change. Fees, terms, and restrictions apply. See CricketWireless.com for details.